Hey everybody, it's the 3D Printing Professor, and today we are going in depth into slicers. So what is a slicer? Put simply, a slicer is a piece of software that turns a 3D model into instructions that a printer can follow to create a 3D object. Slicers do not create the 3D models. For that, you need to have a separate piece of software, CAD or design software of some sort that you can use to create the 3D model, or you can download the 3D model online that somebody else created, and then bring that into your slicer, have it create the instructions to send to your printer, and then the printer will follow those instructions. Now, Printers, 3D printers follow the instructions that a slicer creates almost blindly. It's like the slicer is creating a treasure map for somebody who's going to be blind and deaf while following it. And so slicers have a lot to do with the success or failure of 3D prints. Now there are at this time three major slicers out there that people use. They are Slithreer, Cura, created by the Ultimaker Corporation, and Simplify 3D. Each one of these systems is different, they're created by different people, and they are slightly different in how they manage prints. People have their opinions about which one's better or not. We could go into depth in that in a future video, but for now, I just want to go over the general idea that all slicers have, the general settings that slicers have to make a print. Now, it would be nice if slicers were completely transparent. If you just said, hey, this 3D model, I want it made, and it did it. But the problem is, for different prints, there are different demands. And so you want to have a certain level of control over that. And to do that, you need to know the settings that your slicer has and to be able to adjust them. The first setting that you're probably going to want to adjust is your layer thickness. This defines how thick or thin each layer is. If you make the layer thickness higher, your print will go much faster, but it'll be very rigidy. It'll feel like a washboard as you run your fingers down it. Whereas if you make those layers very thin, your print will look fantastic, it will feel great, and it will take forever. Now, generally speaking, most 3D printers work between 100 microns and 250 microns, or 0.1 millimeters and 0.25 millimeters. Some 3D printers can go thinner and some 3D printers can go thicker. Know what your 3D printer is capable of and what the range of layer thicknesses are. Some people like to experiment with this and see if they can push their 3D printer to be 80 microns or 50 micron in layer heights. And that's a fun thing to do, but keep in mind, if you make that layer height too thin, thinner than your 3D printer can handle, then as the, as the material is coming out, it won't have anywhere to go because it didn't move up enough. And instead of squirting out, it'll back squirt into the, the nozzle and it will cause a jam in your printer. So you can experiment with it, but be prepared to clear out a jam if that experiment doesn't go well. The next setting that we can adjust is the shell, or sometimes it's called the outline, or sometimes it's called the wall thickness. In some slicers, you tell it how many times you want it to go around, and it moves in with each layer. I know that with Cura, it does it with an absolute measurement. You say you want your wall thickness to be one millimeter or two millimeter. But the interesting thing about that comes later when we talk about the nozzle diameter and filament or uh, uh, extrusion width. Because if it can't do that thick of a layer, what does Cura do? Does it do one more or one less? And in reality, it does one more. But the point is, we, we need to know these things. And so Cura's doing it in absolute measurements still depends on you knowing your nozzle width to make it work properly. But we can talk about that in just a bit. The next setting that you're going to want to know is top and bottom layers or top and bottom thickness. That is, this first layer that goes down is printed at 100% infill. It's, it's filled in, whereas the middle layers are not. How many layers should it do before it starts doing this infill? Well, that's the bottom layer. Uh, again, Cura likes to do this in absolute measurements, and then it calculates how many layers, and other 3D printers like to ask you. I kind of like Cura on this one because I like to just say, hey, I like my bottom and my top to be a certain thickness and not have to recalculate that if I increase or decrease my layer height. Still, 
The bottom thickness determines how many layers it goes before it starts doing infill. And the top thickness, anywhere that it notices that it's going to hit the top, it goes down a couple of layers and starts printing 100% infill at that point, which for complicated shapes and, and complicated geometries can mean that it's doing it in the middle of a print, in the middle of a layer, when if you have a big flat layer, it'll just start doing it the whole area. Now, why do we have top layers? Well, because of this infill and different materials, some are saggier, some don't set up as quickly, they need more layers to correct the mistakes that are going to happen before you can have a nice top smooth layer. And so you want to put more top layers on there. If you see the top is, is looking terrible and you can see the infill pattern, add more top layers to fix it. The next setting that we might want to talk about are infill settings, and there's lots of infill settings. There is the percentage of infill settings. As this percentage goes up, this infill becomes more and more dense. 0% infill would leave this completely hollow. This right here is, I think, about 20% infill. At about 60 or 80% infill, it becomes extremely dense. And I recommend for most cases, don't go above 80% infill because by then there's practically no air in here and it's thick enough, but it doesn't crowd your print. If you do 100% infill and you have some of your other settings wrong, it could crowd your print and make it less desirable. So generally speaking, I say stop at 80% infill, but experiment with it yourself. Next, there are the settings to control overhang and support. If a 3D print gets to a point where there's nothing underneath it when it hits that layer, it will need to build a support structure up to it so that when it prints, it's got something underneath it and those supports can be removed and cleaned up later. You can set how dense the support structure is. You can set where the support structure is set. One of the most common settings for support structure is whether you want it to be everywhere or just from the build plate. Notice how, how this print has a little disc at the bottom of it. And that disc right there blocks the build plate from being seen from the hat. And so had I turned on just from the build plate, there would be no support structure underneath the hat of the wizard because it can't see the build plate from where it's at. Now, sometimes that's desirable because if you have support structure on top of a part, it can be harder to remove. In this case, the top was completely flat, so the support's removed very easily. But it's good to know that you have that option and experiment with it. You can also define in your slicer the filament diameter setting. Now, normally you're not going to change this. However, if you get filament from a different manufacturer, it might be slightly thicker or slightly thinner than the last time. And so to get an accurate print, you might have to adjust that filament diameter setting. Grab some calipers, measure the filament, see how it's doing and adjust that setting. Also, Slicers have to know the size of the nozzle, the hole at the tip of your hot end that's putting out the plastic. A bigger nozzle can do thicker layers and can also print faster, but it can't make as sharp and fine a detail. And so it needs to know if it's coming to a point where it needs to back out before it gets there. Also, some slicers consider extrusion width because when the plastic comes squirting out of there and squishes against the build plate or the previous layer it squishes out and so it'll actually compensate for that with extrusion width generally speaking i leave my extrusion width at my nozzle diameter but if you're finding that you need to get accurate prints and it, you think that that squish is the problem then tell it okay my nozzle diameter is this big but my extrusion width going out just a little bit more compensate for that with that, there is the flow rate. Now, this is usually measured as a percentage, either as 0 to 100% or 0 to 1 with decimal numbers in between. This is a fudge factor that slicer programmers put in there in order to adjust and compensate that you've measured the filament diameter and it's right and you've measured the nozzle diameter and it's right and you just can't get it fine back it off a little bit don't feed as much plastic into there sometimes that'll fix it 
that flow rate setting is important if you need to do accurate prints, but for most of the time, just leave it at 100%, I think. If the 3D printer has to print something that breaks into two parts at any time, or is just two separate parts entirely, at some point, it's going to have to move the hot end from one part to the other part. If the material that you're using is either really stringy or really melty and gonna flow out, then you could end up with really undesirable bits on your prints. And so to fix that, your slicer can tell your 3D printer to retract the plastic instead of feeding it out pull it back in, take it out of the nozzle, and this setting is called retraction. You can tell it how fast to retract, how far to retract. Experiment with this setting if you're seeing problems in your prints where it begins or ends a print, especially after a travel, or if you're seeing stringy things. Some, some pla uh, materials just can't be compensated for no matter how you fix the retraction, but more retraction will work. But be careful, if you retract too far or too fast, some filaments will get clogged in the nozzle or they'll go too far up the build and while they're still melty, get stuck to the inside of the feed tube and it will cause a problem. So don't go too far with your retraction, just experiment with it, like I've said before. Some 3D printers can control their fan speed and so there's a setting in the slicer for the sp fan speed. Some materials like PLA love to have that fan just blowing right on them, but if you blow on it on something that's too tall and thin, it might cause it to wiggle, so maybe you want to back off the fan speed. Some materials like ABS do not like the fan, so turn that fan down or off for that material. This setting very much depends on the material that you're using. So now we're getting into the territory of slicer settings that you're not going to need all the time, but they're good to know about. One of these settings is the skirt or brim. Now, these are both the same idea, but sometimes they're broken into two different settings. The skirt is a outline that is drawn around your part before it starts printing and the purpose of this is to give your plastic plenty of time to get into the nozzle and start feeding properly if you're noticing that your prints are are not printing as well or not sticking as well especially on that first outline then waste that time in a skirt getting the filament to plant to print well however you might have a print setting that gets it going before it even starts i know a lot of the prints that i do just draw this big line across the front which is usually enough time for the print to work out well so i skip the the skirt entirely but this idea can be extended and used for a very important purpose. If you take that and bring it right to your print and have it do two, three, six outlines as it goes, it will create a solid base for your print that you will have to remove after the print is done. But if you're printing something tall and thin that's gonna wiggle and possibly not make it to the top, giving it that more solid base and sticking it to the build plate will solve that problem. Also, if you're printing with a material that shrinks and is going to pull itself off the build plate before it starts, creating that multiple size skirt on there will cause that skirt to be the first thing to shrink off and probably save your print. And so skirts are good for that. Most slicers allow you to insert custom G-code. G-code is the instructions that the slicer is making and they're instructions that the printer follows. Things like, like if this were a treasure map, take 15 steps in this direction, then turn this direction and take another 10 steps. Although with 3D printers, it's uh, human readable, kind of, but it doesn't look anything like English. It's a bunch of indecipherable codes, but you can look up what those codes are. And if you find that you want to manually insert code to do special things, your slicer will allow you to do that. But that is some advanced tricks. I want you to know it's possible. All right, so that's uh, almost all that I have to say about slicers and we'll leave it there for now. I hope that this will help you get a little bit more comfortable using slicers because they are the first part of a 3D print and you're gonna have to use them. Don't think of them as, as too much of an imposition. Think of them as the power to really use this tool for what you want.
As always, thank you very much for watching. And as with all of these 3D Print 101 videos, if you need more information about it, go hit up my blog where I'm doing a complete write-up about these things. And if this has helped you, go ahead and like it, share it, leave a comment telling me what you think or if you have any other questions. As always, safety first. And I'll see you next time. How many layers does it do before it starts doing? Oh, whoops. This is the one where my list goes crazy. Okay.